Okay, so it's the start of a new year. And what, if anything, should you be doing with your retirement accounts in order to take full advantage of the next 12 months? And remember, there's the theory, and then there's what we do in practice. And as a fee-only financial advisor for over 20 years, I can share with you that oftentimes, the right answer for an individual family might be different than what the theory is. So in today's video, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I think we all need to be thinking about when a new year starts. It doesn't need to be in January, but it tends to be a good time to look at things. Okay, the first thing is making sure that your long-term allocation, making sure that your portfolio is staying up to date with that long-term allocation. For instance, as, as I record this, the previous 12 months were very strong in the stock market. So if you didn't rebalance during the year, you could find yourself with more exposure to stocks than what you really want to have over the long term. So at least once a year, I think you should rebalance your account and make sure that you're staying consistent with whatever that long term allocation that's right for you. Now, some people do this monthly, some people do it quarterly. Uh, I think monthly might be too often uh, and once a year is probably on the outer edge of what you want to do. But if you haven't done it, the start of the year is a great time to do that. Again, remember what you're trying to do is, you know, let's say your allocation is 60% to stocks and 40% to bonds. And let's say stocks had a really good year. You're, you're going to be selling some stocks at a high price, right? Because at least as we speak right now, the market's at or near all-time highs. And I would much rather rebalance, meaning sell some stocks when they're at a high price, rather than if the market goes through a correction and it scares me, and now mentally, maybe I'm a forced seller at a low price, which is what we're all trying to avoid. That's where people get hurt, is when they become forced sellers at low prices. And Typically that happens because you need the cash for a life event or, or maybe even a planned life event like retirement, you take X dollars out every quarter. Um, and if you don't have some cash buffer, then when you need that money for that quarter, you know, what choice do you have if all your money's in stocks? You have to sell stocks at a low price. So you're a forced seller there or more often what I see is people are forced sellers because in a down market, it gets scary, it messes with your mind. Oftentimes, if you're over allocated to stocks, people find themselves in a situation where it's just creating so much stress that they need to relieve some of that stress. So don't let that happen to you. At least once a year, I want you to rebalance your account. Um, I also want you to look at your asset allocation and say, does this allocation make sense for me for the next five years, the next three, five, seven years. As we get older, the way risk feels to us changes. When you can easily add more money to your account, when you still have 20 years until you're, you're gonna retire, a, a severe market downturn like the financial crisis or the start of COVID feels very differently when you still have 20 years than if you've only got five years until you're hoping to retire or three years or you're already in retirement. So you wanna get ahead of the curve on that and make these changes to your asset allocation, both because of maybe what the stock market's done over the last 12 months, which was my first point, and also based on your current situation as you get closer to retirement, you wanna reflect on that and make sure the asset allocation is right for you. Okay, another thing is look at the income generating tools that you might have in your portfolio. And you're like uh, this, where many of us are gonna be cutting back on stocks. The question is, what do you put that in? Um, this is not financial advice. This is not investment advice uh, for you. I don't know your situation. It cannot be tailored to you. But many people will put that money in bonds, something that's gonna be less volatile than the stock market. And if you're putting your money into bonds, be thinking about, you know, what are the rates of return that I can get this year? It's quite a bit different than what you could have got certainly three years ago or even two years ago. 
Uh, turns out it's pretty close to what it was exactly a year ago as I record this. But, you know, just to use U.S. government debt, treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds as an example, as I record this for the six-month treasury, you get just a tiny bit better than five and a quarter. For a one-year treasury, you're getting 4.85%. For a two-year treasury note, you're getting 4.37%. For a three-year, you're getting a little bit less, 4.13%. For the five-year, you're getting just under 4%, 3.98%. And for the 10-year, now, it wasn't that long ago, literally uh, three months ago, that you could get almost 5% in a 10-year treasury. And right now, we're right at 4%. Now, who, the, the real question is what's interest rates going to be in the future. But you do want to look at when you rebalance, let's say you are cutting back on your stock exposure, what are you going to put that money in? You don't want it sitting in cash, not getting any return. You want some of it in cash, right? We still want our three to six months of uh, living expenses for an emergency fund. Now, the higher income wage that you're earning and the harder it is to replace that job, you might want to have more than three or six months in an emergency fund. If you think it's going to take 12 to 18 months to find another job at that area, uh, at that wage, you know, you probably do want to keep six months, 12 months, maybe even more uh, fully liquid and somewhere you can uh, get a hold of it. Uh, for many of us, that would be money at the bank down the street or your bank can probably buy treasuries for you as well, but you wanna have that liquid account. That's another thing to look at. Another one is, I've said it before, these three bucket strategies. You don't wanna to get to where you're retired and all of your money is in a traditional 401k or all of your money is in a traditional IRA. And the reason you don't want that is every dollar you're taking out of that account. You know, if, if you need to buy a gallon of milk, You've got to take that money out of your 401k, your regular 401k. You've got to pay income tax on it. Um, and then in many states, you're paying uh, tax on the food that you buy as well. Um, so I, the joke is you don't want to be in a situation where you buy a gallon of milk and you have to pay income tax on it. So for most people, it makes sense to have some money in a regular IRA or regular 401k some money in a Roth version of a 401k, a Roth version of an IRA, and then some money that's sitting around in an after-tax basis, just in a regular bank account, a regular uh, brokerage account. So you have money that's not gonna get taxed because it's just in your regular bank account. You've already paid tax on the money there. You have money in a Roth that's not gonna get taxed because that's how the rules work. You don't get the tax break on the way in. It does grow. Um, income tax free. And then as long as you meet all the requirements, when you take money out of a Roth, you're not paying tax on that. And of course, a traditional IRA, traditional 401k, you get the tax break on the way in, it grows tax free. But unfortunately, when you take money out, you have to pay tax on it. So looking at those three buckets. Um, and then one other thing, and this is kind of counterintuitive, you might also want to look at um, both um, tax loss harvesting, which are positions that might be at a loss that are you've held over 12 months uh, so that you can get some of those long-term losses. Same thing with some gains. If you're in a low tax bracket, uh, the, the tax brackets for capital gains are quite a bit higher than a lot of people think. It's You pay zero uh, capital gains tax if you're single on the first $47,025 of capital gains. I'm not an accountant. I don't know your situation, but these are from the IRS tables. And if you're married for the first almost $95,000. So, um, and that, that's from a capital gain standpoint. So if, if you can harvest some of those capital gains at the low tax bracket, even if it's, even if it's at the 15% tax bracket, that's something that you want to explore at the beginning of the year, the end of the year is a great time to look into doing that. Uh, I also want you to think about watching this video here, which talks about the benefits of retiring early. Five reasons to retire as soon as you can. I'll see you in there. Bye-bye.